All right, so we're on to week four of our uh, coronavirus, COVID-19 confinement, but uh, I think I've been doing a pretty good job getting out of the house. And um, I have, again, massive respect for people who do boat bottoms after uh, laboring underneath our little 27 footer up at New England Boat Works, Safe Harbor New England Boat Works. And uh, I will say, I'm glad our little boat's only 27 feet and it's uh, half the size of the monsters around me, but uh, day on the bottom, I'm definitely ready to put in the water and go play. So um, I hope you guys are as well. So this week we've got um, our special guest, Victor uh, Diaz de Leon. Some of you guys may know, some not. And um, uh, trying to bring in some pros every once in a while to find out what they've been doing. And uh, so Victor is kind of a funny one. I had never heard of him until a couple years ago when we started a little feature thing that said, uh, like I reached out to you know, top guys in sport like all you guys and said, uh, who's the next generation of young cool sailors coming up? And uh, I think it was Tony Ray that raised his hand and said, yeah, you got to check out this guy, Victor. So we did, uh, okay, we did. And we found him out at the San Diego Nude. And we did a pretty funny photo shoot with him. He was brave enough to show up in uh, a nice woolly bear fur coat. And uh, it was, the photos were great. But so since that was kind of early in Victor's career, and then he's gone on to do some pretty amazing things with some some pretty top end one design programs. And uh, so uh, maybe we sort of introduce him a little bit. And uh, I, I, the other day I noticed on Facebook, he was wailing some songs and thought, wow, we got to have him on. So um, let's pin uh, Victor here. and. See what you got. So, Victor, uh, a quick background on your story. Uh, thanks for having me, guys. I'm stoked to be here with you guys. Um, yeah, you know, I've been uh, really lucky to have had, I had the chance to sail with a bunch of great people and uh, had great mentors and, you know, kind of try to learn uh, everything I could from each one of them. And, uh, you know, I've, um, I've been just uh, doing a lot of sailing. I've, uh, I've uh, kind of became uh, a full-time tactician, and I'm really enjoying that, trying to, uh, you know, keep improving my game. and. Uh, yeah, that's pretty. That's pretty. Uh, pretty cool. And uh, in terms of uh, playing that song or, or playing a song for you guys, I I always wanted to learn how to play an instrument. And a year ago, I went to Venezuela, and I saw how they were. Uh, which is my. I, I'm from Venezuela, by the way. It's my hometown, my home country. Um, and I saw how they had these porandas, which are these parties in uh, Christmas time, and uh, all the musicians from uh, from each uh, town uh, congregate in the church. And the whole town sings along with them, and I thought that would be pretty cool to play a, an instrument like these guys. So I started taking classes, um, and uh, yeah, I, I'm enjoying it. I'm learning. I know like 15 songs now. <laughs> so what do you got for us first? You're in Miami, I'm assuming, based on the backdrop. Uh, yeah, exactly. So I'm in Miami. Uh, you know, not a lot of there's no sailing going on right now, unfortunately. But I'm just trying to keep busy, uh, doing a lot of uh, bike riding, working on my powerboat. I've been doing a lot of fishing. Uh, but uh, since I got my boat out of the water, they closed all the ramps. So I'm kind of waiting for the ramps to open so I can go fishing again. Um, but, you know, trying to stay busy, doing good stuff while, uh, you know, there's not much going on. I've been riding the bike with uh, Stephanie and Taylor a lot. Uh, so that's been really fun. There's a uh, good group of sailors uh, going out on the bike. Uh, nice. So that's been cool. All right, let's give us a tune. What do you got? All right. So this song is, uh, they usually play it in uh, Christmas time. This kind of, this genre. And uh, it's kind of upbeat, and um, it's about a girl that, you know, this guy has a big crush on this girl that's really pretty. So uh, here we go. It's called uh, La Mosa, which means like the good looking girl. Nice. 
Nice. Thank you. Dude, you got it down. You got the knocking and everything. That's good. Yeah, man. And it's an uh, easy too. guitar. I move around to take regattas. And... I want to uh, meet I the girl. To, I took it to Italy once. Yeah, I took it to uh, the J7 in North America, uh, the Europeans in Lake Garda, uh, so I could practice. And um, yeah, this is actually a Venezuelan instrument. It has four strings. Uh, it's kind of like a mix between a ukulele and a guitar. It's a little bit bigger than a ukulele, smaller than a guitar. Nice. All right. Well, Pretty thanks awesome. for that. Appreciate it. And um, be nice to sort of get together and listen to that real time and um, have some shows and some regattas and bring some music to events when we can get together. So uh, joining us today for that purpose, it's uh, Pin Brad here, Brad Reed and uh, Matt Duggan uh, running, running the show at uh, Sail Newport. And I'm going to start with you, Brad, because this is a big time for you, a uh, big time for Sail Newport, because the sailing class is still going to figure that out. But, you know, for our racing audience, we got to, mm -hmm. you know, your calendar is supposed to start pretty soon. And I know you've been, you're like tight with the governor and, you know, you have the limited state park. So you got your uh, different kind of rules than yacht clubs might have. So, so what do you, what are you guys thinking? How, when, when can you hopefully get things rolling? And what were some thoughts on how we can do some events differently, given we have guidelines? Yeah, well, thanks, Dave, and uh, good to see you all. Um, and, and I just want to introduce Matt Duggan, first of all, who's our regatta director here at Sail Newport. Um, there's many Duggins that run races all over the world, but he's the best one. Um, uh, so he's, he and I are going to kind of tag team a little bit on this, um, what we're thinking. Uh, but from the, from the outset of this whole crisis, um, we've considered this an opportunity um, to bring family sailing back, family racing back, family um, or localized sailing. Um, and, and the number one priority is to be able to provide something when people are allowed to go back on the water and potentially go racing. But we will not do that without a very strict coordination with our state and local agencies, both on whatever social distancing means at that time, and specifically what are the hygiene protocols that we, we would have. Now, what is racing? Ra racing is anything, guys. I mean, this is not something that we're expecting to be going out and running a three race circle in the next, uh, three circles uh, in a big giant regatta for the, for the next little bit. But racing can be anything. Racing could be running it off the dock here, right? running it straight off the pier and in J22s with families that are quarantining together. Racing could be doing more uh, timing races where you are picking a weather window and going around Aquidneck Island, much like the Mount Gay uh, around, um, around Jamestown record. Uh, so it's, there's many different options. And I don't uh, think that we should, um, we should do much in the way of running events until we get guidance from our state and local authorities. And that means getting ahead of things. Uh, Matt's going to talk a little bit about some of the things that he's been doing uh, to uh, jot down on piece and, and memorialize what a race could be. But if we don't get out front and tell our local and regional leaders what a regatta could be without social events, with uh, adequate social distancing, uh, basically making sure that we, we comply to whatever uh, governmental restrictions are, then we're not gonna go racing and we're gonna look like outliers. So we have to get ahead of it. We have to make sure that we put things in writing. How could it work? And this is the protocols and pro uh, procedures uh, that we need to utilize. All right, fire away, Matt. What, what's your, what's your uh, bullet points? Yeah, so a couple weeks ago, we, we sat down and, and we started talking about what this would look like once things resumed. And, and, I, and I guess Sail Newport's a little bit unique in that, for those who don't know, um, we are on state property in Fort Adams State Park. So when Brad talks about state and government regulations, you know, those are things that we take extremely seriously because we have DEM in front of us every single day running the park. And, um, you know, in addition to prioritizing safety, you know, we always certainly want to keep the best relationship with them that we possibly can. And um, so we started to break down our regattas and we started to take a look at, you know, what parts were vital and um, 
and what parts we could possibly run races without. And um, we broke the people up into three groups. We broke the individuals up in a regatta as Sail Newport staff, our volunteers, and the competitors. And we basically decided, you know, the pain points and the bottlenecks in a regular race day are really the arrival each morning and the departure each day. So we started to put into paper, um, you know, how could we create efficiencies in the morning and then off the water each night to get people in and out of the park safely to race. And uh, for, for our keelboat events, that was doing a lot of things that organizations are already doing that are allowed to stay open. Things like grocery stores, putting demarcations on the ground to keep distance between people. Um, you know, we have the Alofsen piers in our park where we keep a million boats, you know, like last summer it was 12 meter worlds, I see 37 charter periods. I mean, it was just jam packed. So we kind of tried to space that out a little bit and figure out how can we keep groups of boats on those docks and get people to those boats safely and get them off the dock safely um, so that it would, you know, fall in line with what government regulations were imposing. And something that we kind of realized was that a regatta as a whole, especially to a non-sailor, was oftentimes looked at this big, massive ordeal, including off the water socials, which were you know, in a lot of people's minds required for the regatta. And uh, we started to kind of break that down and say, well, as much as the socials are important, like the on the water racing is by far the most important. And, and what can we do to just get people on the water and go sailing? Um, so we broke up those people and, and the staff were broken up. And, you know, on a given day for a regatta, we might have eight staff members. And, and you know, if it's a keelboat event, allocating a couple staff members to our docks to ensure that you know, people were following, you know, proper social distancing and, and making sure that people had all any questions they might have about the park answered. And uh, when it came to our volunteers, I think the biggest concern that I had and, and you know, for a lot of organizations, the volunteer core is generally older. Um, we have a lot of volunteers who are in their 60s and given um, given the COVID-19 and, and, you know, who in, is in most jeopardy of um, getting the virus, we were, we were really concerned about if we get all of these folks together in groups, you know, how can we manage it properly so that they don't have to interact as much? Um, so it came down to, you know, doing some Zoom video calls before events so that we could really dial in what procedures were going to be during race day so that people didn't have to show up and congregate in big groups for skippers meetings. Um, as far as our competitors go, things like no morning check-in, you know, keeping everything digital and online so that sailors just had to show up, get to their boat, and get out on the water. Obviously, it's a little bit different if it's an event where there's measurement or weigh-in or things like that, but for a lot of our events this summer, it's simply getting people to their boats and getting them out onto the water safely. And to be able to do that, um, like I said, socials are important, but, you know, we just want to get people out on the water. Um, remember earlier this year, I was upset about the Red Sox trading Moogie Betts, and I, I wasn't going to follow the Red Sox this summer anymore. And when all sports got canceled, I wanted nothing more than to watch a Red Sox game. And that's kind of how sailing is like, you know, we have these ideas of these great big events, but now a lot of people are just being realistic about what they can do. And they just want water in some capacity. And like Brad said, you know, when things start to ease up, we want to be able to have the the policies and procedures in place to show DEM in the state. You know, these are the steps and precautions that we're taking. This is what our event is going to look like. Is this feasible given what you have as guidelines right now? Um, we don't just to add what Matt just said, there's a new normal. And unfortunately, we really don't know when the new restrictions start getting coming down for on in everyone's states. Maryland's locked down right now. Rhode Island, at least you can go day sailing. So there's going to have to be some consistency. Um, at some point, there'll be some consistency. Uh, but each individual area is going to have to adapt uh, to, to these new normals. And again, I think it's an opportunity. You know, there might not be a 100 boat J70 regatta, but there should be some really good 10 to 15 boat J70 regattas around to San Francisco uh, for, for a major big boat series. 
but there could be some local big boat series that could run and we can we can run them in in positive and and fun environments getting people just to enjoy their boats and uh, that's that's the number one priority is getting allowing people that want to participate opportunities to participate without trying to 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 you know make a mega regatta um, you know I, I feel terrible that we can't have a Charleston race week this year or you know the New, New York Yacht Club annual regatta is postponed th th that's terrible but you know let's let's make sure we're rigged and ready and ready to go when people are able to use their boats and race their boats. And no matter how that looks, we'll be out there to help run races. So real quick, Brad, there's a, it's, it's easy to overlook there. I mean, you, you as an operation have fixed costs and everybody's as well. And, and that's where I think we've sort of gotten used to the sponsorship element of being able to subsidize, especially places like you. I mean, what are you, you guys have some thoughts on the expectations of sponsors as well. And I mean, how you kind of provide provide less, but also sort of uh, cater to the sponsor's needs. Sure. I mean, yeah, you're breaking up a little bit, but I think the question was, um, you know, sponsor expectations. Yeah. I mean, guys, uh, honestly, uh, we're going to do this without sponsors right now. Um, it's, it's important just to provide the service of the stopwatch, the whistle, the scoring, and allowing people to go and go racing. I, I love sponsors, don't get me wrong. We, we love sponsors. But right now, I, I just don't, I don't feel comfortable um, necessarily going out and selling those sponsorship packages, which have a big social part, uh, a social end of it. Um, sure, we'll, we'll be back. You know, th those days are ahead of us. But right now, let's just go out there and, and blow some whistles. And whether it's, a, I got a call from, um, uh, Jim Schwartz, Money Penny, uh, Vesper, it, their, their uh, project manager. They just want to go sailing. They'll do a an IAC around the island race if it's scheduled. They'll they'll do a re record run around Jamestown. They just want to go sailing. So as as we think of these things, Dave, we can't think in our standard traditional boxes. Um, we need to do it differently. And and for the sport, I think it's important that we just allow people the opportunity to go for a sailboat race. Show up, do the race, go home, maybe have a Zoom cocktail party, um, but not worry about the bells and whistles right now. Allow people to have fun on their boats. Yeah, how about Tony and Peter on, on the big boat side and even Jonathan, yeah, I mean, is, is there a way to get some of the big boats back out sailing, some of the maxis and super yachts, or is that, you think that'll be quiet for a while until, you know, things change? Yeah, I mean, I can I just jump in first. Um, first of all, the Brad and Matt, your leadership is what we need right now, and it's awesome to hear you guys. Um, I think it's great. And then, um, you know, on the big boat side, it's it's just coincidental, but in a half an hour, I've got a call with the the guys that run the Candy Store Cup, which is a, you know, a super yacht regatta here in Newport. That's, um, you know, that so they want to try to preserve the event. We're trying to come up with some creative ways to help do that. So. You know, I wear a lot of hats in the sport. One of them was with Doyle Sales, and I've got, you know, Mike Topa from North. He and I are, are looking at this together, try to figure out how to kind of more boots on the ground. How can we create a way to get people enjoying their boats? How can we help foster that? So, th so we're working on it. You know, I know that some of the big boat events in Europe are, you know, we'll see if that happens. I think it'd be great if, uh, if, if the European season was able to kind of uh, salvage some races in the fall. But at this point, I, I really just have to echo what Brad was saying. Our, our racing is going to be organic. Uh, and Brad and I have actually personally talked about this recently. It's going to be organic. It's going to be local. Um, may not involve a ton of travel, but it's going to be just, you know, really good instigators and motivators like Brad and Matt to kind of figure out how we can creatively get people on the water. So, you know, great to hear that Jim Schwartz want to, wants to come racing in Newport. I love the idea of around the island race great way to keep boats apart, um, cool race course, you know, things like that. And I actually have a question for maybe Brad or Matt, if, since you guys have really gotten in front of this, have you been in touch with any of the other kind of regions in the country of like, hey, how are you guys? What are you guys thinking? Here's what we're thinking. Yeah, you know, I think everybody kind of feels the same way. I think we, like I said, being on state property, we were kind of forced into a position where we wanted to 
be very proactive about it and understand exactly what could be done and what couldn't be done. Um, you know, we heard from some organizations up in Maine, their, you know, their season is considerably shorter and it kicks off later. So they're not quite as far down the thought process yet, but, um, you know, there are some folks down in Annapolis who kind of feel like the exact same way they're putting docs in and they're getting themselves ready to go for whatever it might be. I think a lot of the, you know, the, the thoughts of a, what a, you know, a normal regatta would look like are kind of just out the window right now. And people are, are working very collaboratively to figure out, okay, how can we help you? Like, what can we do for you? You know, if a certain event can't be held early in the summer and, and Sam Newport has an opportunity or a weekend later in the year, you know, we're more than happy to have the conversations and figure out what we can do to help run that event instead. This is kind of like, a, it's almost like the pressure's eased and it's like, all right, let's just work together and see what we can do to get as many people out on the water as possible. And so I, I really feel like a lot of people have that mindset um, that are just kind of waiting and getting ready to go and hit the ground running as soon as we get opportunities. Will this be the first summer that sailing is actually free? <laughs> well, I didn't say free. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly, it'll be reduced. I think uh, the, the big boat um, is a little problematic. You know, I still think about those 10 people stacking the rail right next to each other. I just, I just don't see it unless there's been some sort of pre-quarantine or unless everyone's Correct. been tested. Or... Correct, Jonathan. You're exactly right. The one thing that I think is feasible and safe um, is small boat sailing. Exactly. Um, so, you know, what we've been trying to do here in Seattle, and we've been lucky that the ramps are still open, um, is there's been a resurgence in the Arrow and the Taser class as ways that it's either single-handed or people that live together can go out and go sailing. Um, so we've been lucky that that's been possible. And um, I think for this summer, the majority of my sailing is going to be on a one or two person boat. Mm -hmm. uh, I do think this is an opportunity to um, simplify a regatta structure that generally has gotten a bit bloated and, and overblown. So just, and we're going to try to run a regatta here um, in two weekends, a one day regatta um, where all we have is just uh, two people in the race committee boat, husband and wife, um, but the arrows and tasers are invited, you know, a big enough rigging area that everybody can um, be far enough apart um, and no social events. Um, so I think doing that is safe. I've thought about it a lot and I just, I, don't, I think if everyone's respectful and does it right, um, I think it's a way to have an actual race. We agree. That's exactly the, the concept, Jonathan. You're, you're spot on. And as far as the big boat stuff, I don't see a change in allowing for big boat race management until the restrictions on social distancing goes up to that 10 people can be close together and the te all the testing and all those hot button issues that are out in the world are somewhat solved, but I do see opportunities, like you say, for single-handed racing, single-handed, a lot of us uh, sailing programs and sailing schools might have to adapt their 420 fleet to be cat-rigged 420s and go and, and sail single-handed 420s. And I have, we have Nick Ewenson looking into that right now. So lasers, uh, 420s families, uh, opties certainly can, can still potentially race, with the right guidelines and, and procedures and policies. But the, you know, the, this summer will not have 400 vote opti regattas. I mean, that's, that's, we're pretty sure of that. And people shouldn't be looking for that. They should be looking for those local communities. Like you say, mom and dad out in the race committee boat, let's go, let's go, send it. Hey, Peter, you had a question? Yeah, I was, uh, it kind of got brought up, but, uh, I think what, what Brad and Matt are doing are great and um, taking a, a look forward and, uh, into the crystal ball and kind of leading the charge rather than being dragged along. And you guys, as you pointed out, are quite are somewhat different than a yacht club or Jonathan's event where you're constrained uh, to follow some more rules and, and toe the line being inside a state park. But as you go and try to, you describe painting the picture for 
turning what our supermarket experience is to regatta, which all makes sense and you're selling that to the governmental organizations. But uh, as Jonathan brought up, it seems like the elephant in the room is the fact that if you have anybody but family members that are sailing together um, and within six feet of each other, it's no longer a supermarket style event. And that's what anything but something like single-handed or double-handed with families is, is it looks like. So how do you approach that aspect of it when you're painting the picture and trying to sell it to the, uh, the government or as you're thinking about doing that? Yeah, that's a great question, Peter. And I think a lot of it, you know, Rhode Island is looking at a three or four phase reopening procedure now. And I think we would, you know, try to do something similar where our early stages would be creating some sort of maybe family-based event, not very many boats, to see what that looks like and kind of use that as a trial where, you know, like you said, these are people that have been quarantining and living together. You know, they've, they've been around each other, getting them in a boat and running a small race with them and seeing how that goes. And, you know, as government restrictions start to ease, talking about kind of pressing more towards what I was discussing, which is maybe a 20 person um, laser regatta, maybe a 10 person, a 10 boat thistle regatta, and just starting to ease it out that way and, and roll it out as kind of in line with what the government's going to be doing as far as opening different types of stores and, and what capacity those stores can reopen. And I said, I said this to Dave, I think, in a conversation last week, and I certainly said it to Tony, where does uh, personal choice and institutional risk, where, where's that you know, where's the intersection? And how that personal choice allows us to go on the water with a group of our friends to go cruising, day sailing, or, or um, racing. How, how does that, how is the easing process in our communities and our governmental agencies going to allow for that? And I think until you can have 10 people, you know, be able to be in the same six to 10 foot radius, whatever that rule is, I have a hard time finding out how you can put a, you know, a big boat team together. So we're going to have to concentrate on where we can, Peter, and that's, that's dinghy sailing, which brings us all back to our roots, right? And, and uh, get out the ironing boards, get out your laser, you know, bring Scott McLeod out of, uh, out of uh, retirement, get him up here, and, and we're, we're going to strap on the lasers. Does that, does that apply to you, Ed? What do you, you still have one hanging in the garage? <laughs> What we have for a long time, I, I think probably in this group, I've probably owned more lasers than any of it, but uh, we got rid of our last one about uh, four months ago, which was uh, apparently bad timing. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, that's the thing is down here in Florida, I mean, we have a lot of people on the water. There's a lot of people sailing, but they're sailing, you know, with family members, they're sailing with double handed with husband and wife not racing, just out sailing their boats. Which is fine. Um, people fishing, people just going, you know, out in their boat to look at houses. But um, there's, there's no racing at all. And um, however, it would be fairly straightforward to, uh, you know, to start putting uh, single-handed dinghies in the water. Um, we have plenty of spaces where, you know, that can happen. Um, but of course, you know, there's always going to be the argument, what about when it's time to wash the boat off? Who touches the hose? And, you know, I mean, there, there's all those little things that have to be thought through to make sure that we're safe and that we're not seen as, uh, as a sport wise, um, you know, as, as uh, you know, flaunting the rules in any way. Hey, Victor, can you give uh, Mr. Baird some, some moth lessons or can, can you think you can get him into it? Uh, I think it'd be a weapon. Man. He's got the perfect size. <laughs> No yeah. Uh, Gary, you, uh, for maybe a quick insight from Annapolis Yacht Club, which is Annapolis is just, just filled with big boats. And, you know, that seems to be the, you know, the kind of the action there. What, what's, what's your sense in, in this other sailing capital of the world? The other sailing capital of the world. Very good, Dave. I appreciate that. We're in lockdown. Uh, you can't do any recreational boating on Chesapeake Bay at the present time. But I must say there's been a lot of pressure put on the governor to relax that. Uh, and Ed's questions are really good. You know, who touches the hose and how do you clean the boat? 
And, uh, you know, what Brad and Matt were talking about is really good going forward in the future. So I, I applaud what they're having to say. So I hope the boating restriction here in the Chesapeake is lifted in the near future. I have a gut feeling it will, but I'm sure there'll be some kind of criteria, no rafting up, for example, maybe not sailing at night, uh, limiting the number of people on a boat, keeping it to sailing members. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at my boat on Spa Creek, uh, about 200 feet from where I'm sitting right now, and it's calling to me, come on, let's go sailing. It's blowing about 18. It'd be a nice afternoon to take the boat out. So that's anyway the situation down here in the other sailing capital. Real quick, um, is there a take on this from the world sailing sort of global view on how to embrace what's going on, or is it too too early to, for them to take any action? No, we had a medical commission report, which is pretty thorough, come out a few weeks ago that is on the website. Our, we had a board meeting this morning to talk about a lot of things, but we're going to meet next Tuesday, May 5th, and uh, to talk about what events we cancel, what kind of guidance we have. And uh, with the Olympics canceled, that puts us into quite a financial disarray, which I'm sure Sail Newport's feeling too. And uh, I think you're going to find quite a few things canceled through the balance of 2020. All right. So uh, it's a real quick one, one idea. You know, we were sort of talking about this informal, it's kind of Brad and Matt, that you say, let's just, you know, what happens if we have these informal get togethers that start to get too big, where you say, we're just going to, you know, how do you promote sailing events without having them be official or things like that? You know, if, if you do sort of the, the Chris Musler style rage and all of a sudden it gets too big, are there, are there challenges that, you know, are out of your control? Uh, well, I think, the more we can encourage people meeting on the water, going sailing and going home yeah. is, I think that's one of the most important parts of this. Now, if we have a J22 event, we have 14 J22s here and we have a families only regatta of some sort. Yeah, there's going to be protocols and procedures put in place. Might have to wear masks, probably have to wear masks for the short term. Um, where they park, how they get to their boat, the staff cleans your boat. You don't touch a hose. You know, the staff, everybody disperses. They go their, their separate ways into their cars, off they go. We clean the boats and we have, a, a, you know, a CDC guideline hygiene protocol that we're studying and trying to enact. Uh, that'll be the way of the future, of the near future. Um, but when the, when the events become, we're gonna hold a start at 11 o'clock at noon, one o'clock in the afternoon, off of the point at Fort Adams, around the island, clockwise, you know, five, four, three, two, one, go. People meet on the water, they sail, they go home. And that's the only way it's gonna work. Now, maybe more cruising boats will decide they wanna do this. You know, mom and pop, uh, little, you know, Pearson 36, will get on a Vanderwall to go, he, he, he and his wife, Kenley, and their kids uh, sail their Pearson 36 around the island. They've never done that. They've never raced their living room. Maybe people will decide to come out and start racing their living rooms a little bit and, and, and take their cruising boats. But if they come, they race, they go, I think we can handle something like that. You know, Brad, I, you make me laugh a little because every time I go sailing, whether it's day sailing or out, out cruising, whatever boat is near me, I'm racing against them. It's just Good point. inherent in my, I'm, I'm sure you're probably the same way. <laughs> Yeah, Jonathan, go. Hey, uh, this it's a slightly different topic, but I think the one thing that we have seen is um, people getting their sailing fix um, from online forums and both uh, sort of entertainment of, uh, you know, cool past regattas and stuff like that, and also educational. So um, the rise in um, publicly available high-level education about sailboat racing in these last few months has been tremendous. Very I mean, true. you can go online right now and learn so much great stuff. Yep. Um, so, you know, f th there are positives that have, that have come out of this. Um, and I think that's a big one that we can continue to capitalize on that going forward. Yeah, a lot of knowledge sharing going on right now. Finally, people are uh, getting it out there.
I think that one of the biggest things for us, we, we kind of think about two things, right? We want to be incredibly open-minded and we want to be smart. You know, we want to be open-minded to any changes that might need to take place in order to get people on the water. And we want to be smart about whether or not we can do that and, and when we can go ahead and do that. Moving on. All right, we promise to keep this short. Um, thanks everybody for your insight. Um, we'll look forward to the Thank first you. informal get together. It's kind of a good chance to bring back Portsmouth ratings, small boat sailing. And I just- uh, you, you The archipelago the rally concept, the archipelago the rally. Yeah. Hey Dave, I had a quick thought. Um, yeah, what, about, um, what about some double-handed coastal racing? Um, you know, maybe it'd be a good opportunity to get into that and, and let some people have that opportunity. Some younger guys have that opportunity since it's going to be a uh, Olympics. You know, it, it involves very few boats, only two people, and boats are pretty far apart. So maybe this is a good time to experiment with that. And there are a lot of people dying to go sailing. You guys have any thoughts on that? Yeah. Is that, that sounds like the launch of an Olympic campaign for you then, Victor. <laughs> <laughs> What's her so name? Was that the one she's about singing that. about? <laughs> um, well, if I ever went sailing on, on something like that, I would like to sail with Katie Pettibone. There She's you go. And uh, I've sailed with her and I really enjoy sailing with her. We so even it, talked about, um, and then, you know, we were, I was really busy with the wand design stuff and I never had a chance to go with her. But, well, you know, there are a bunch of people dying to go sailing, a bunch of guys that could be uh, good candidates for these kind of sailing and maybe never, it hadn't had a chance because being busy or, you know, but um, seems like these, these kind of racing would fit the guidelines uh, to be safe during these times. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Brad. But you, you got to keep it grassroots, though, Victor. If it starts becoming, you know, trying to get a bunch of Beneteau Figaro boats or Genoa 3300s to do this, it's just not going to work. We got to make it grassroots. Grab anything and sail double handed. You know, get, yeah, exactly. Do a J24 if you have to. Yeah, and, exactly. You know, I mean, there are so many J70s. You can double handed J70 and do kind of yeah. a short co coastal race exactly. from, you know, Newport to uh, the capital uh, of Salem to the second capital of Salem. Um, <laughs> I'm not taking a J70 from Newport to freaking <laughs> Annapolis. That's insane. Well, maybe, maybe not. Let's go. Let's Victor will be the first one to do it. <laughs> it depends who she is. Well, I feel safe with Katie. I'll do it with Katie. She's got my back. But meanwhile, I've never been offshore, so I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Bring a fishing rod. Right. All right, cool. Thanks, Jen. Uh, you want to give us an outro, Victor? What's his next uh, and final closing tune you got for us? Um, sure. We can do something. Um, let's see. Um, this is about, uh, this is uh, called Horopo, this kind of uh, music. And it's about, uh, this song is about, uh, about a guy that's traveling with his horse and he's bringing dust from the road because of all his experiences and everything. So it's called Polvo, Traigo Polvo del Camino. Here we go. Yeah, you got the, the pro sailing thing. Uh, you can you can sing your way offshore all day long. There you go. That'd be good. So when we can all get together, we're going to get you and uh, Pedro hooked up together. You can teach him some ballads. I think, yeah, that'd be sweet. I, I would like to go do that with Pedro. He can teach me some, some stuff. He's pretty good at that guitar. We actually played once. I, well, I sang and he played and he made, he made me look good. We did that at his house. That was really cool. 
Nice. Victor Victor played in the basement. It was amazing. That's he it. was he was there was the biggest song of the night. What what song was it, Victor? It was La Bamba. It's something like uh I gotta practice that one. I, I gotta work on it. But <laughs> he, was, he, he, he was backed by our Grateful Dead cover band. It was it was yeah, fantastic. Yeah, that was sick, man. Thanks nice. for that. I enjoyed that a lot. All right. Well, thanks okay. for your time, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Victor, for jumping in. And Thank you, uh, yeah, we'll have to work on our, our, our live uh, recording audio. Maybe we'll get some uh, audio tech help from Peter for next week. But um, I appreciate it. Thank you very much, everybody. And um, All right. look forward to sailing soon. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Dave. Have a good Bye-bye.